Good evening. This is a meeting of the Scarborough Board of Education. It is January 8th, 2015. Can I have attendance, please, Mrs. Sizemore? Yes. Mrs. Bealey? Here. Mr. Chiazzo? Here. Mrs. Ling? Mrs. Massengill? Here. Mrs. Murray? Murphy? Here. Mrs. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Ms. Murray? Here. Ms. Hartle? Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Uh, there is a, uh, an adjustment. Uh, there was a request to add a brief executive session um, to follow the public session. Um, so there would be a motion to go into executive session um, pursuant to 1 MRSA subsection 405, section 6A for the purpose of discussing a personnel matter, not to return to public session. Very good. 5.0, superintendent's report. Uh, just very quickly, I want to draw uh, school board members' attention to the letter of approval uh, that you have. Um, I believe it was distributed tonight. Kelly, is that right? Um, this is from the Department of Education, and it approves our requ request for an extension and for more time to meet the department's proficiency-based graduation <coughs> requirements. As you see on there, I put good news, um, uh, which it is. So uh, we were pleased to do that. It was, um, this was the request for extension that was approved by the board. And um, so we did uh, hear back uh, just before the holiday break. I'm going to basically yield my time to two important guests that we've invited here to update us this evening. Uh, first, I want to introduce to you, um, there's probably no introduction needed, actually, Mr. Uh, Paul Cazell chair of the Wentworth Building Committee for his final report out to the board on the Wentworth School Project. Mr. Cozell has dedicated, indeed, endless hours to leading the efforts of a very large but very talented collection of school staff and community volunteers who have also dedicated endless hours to the Wentworth Project. The great news is that the combination of Mr. Cozell's skillful leadership and the committee's effort and focus has resulted in a success of a previously unimaginable proportion. <laughs> I would like to introduce and to thank Mr. Cozell. Well, I arrived early tonight and had an opportunity to talk with Dan Cecil briefly, and I was convinced everyone was here to see me speak, but I'm <laughs> <laughs> See, Dan has more materials up. Um, sitting in the truck today, Tim Ouellette, who's my business partner, CPM Constructors, and I were driving over to western New Hampshire to look at a bridge project in Lebanon, New Hampshire, at negative 14 degrees. And it sort of dawned on me that it's, maybe it's irony or just how interesting it is that more than four years ago I came before the school board complaining about the school system or about the Wentworth School. It was about 100 degrees out that day with humidity and windows shut. And today we're sort of on the opposite end of the uh, temperature spectrum. But my comments tonight are very brief. Um, as a community, we started this project in 2010. We came together, we formed a 40-member building committee. We recognized and identified the problems at the old Wentworth Intermediate School. We came up with a solution and we solved the problem. Now, four years later, look at what we've accomplished. We built a smart school. We talked about this at the opening ceremony for the school. I still believe it today. We have built a smart school which will serve the needs and best interests of our children, our community for many years to come. Yesterday I had an opportunity to walk around the new Wentworth School. During my walk when I saw kids coming and going, saw teachers talking, and frankly took a, a great look at the new homegrown children art on all the walls, it was clear to me that the school has finally transformed from a learning institution to a learning home. This is when I knew, as a building committee, we had accomplished all of our goals. We'd accomplished all of this while completing the project under budget with money still in the bank. At the time of referendum, I remember we came before the town and we asked them to approve a bond for $39 million for this project. And we won overwhelmingly. To date, we spent less than $36 million on this project. 
a savings or under budget of $3 million. As to administrative costs, non-construction budget costs, and soft costs, which we budgeted $8 million, we stayed at budget. As to contingency, we budgeted a little over $2 million for construction and contingency items on this project. To date, we've only spent about 90%. We've come under the construction contingency budget by about $190,000, so just well done. I put an asterisk against that comment just because that contingency fund still remains open as we go through the first year of the, uh, the school. Regardless of this open item, all this information about the budget is good news. Completing a project of this size under budget with money still in the bank is a remarkable accomplishment. However, this is really just another good example of how well this project has progressed and finished. All aspects of this project have run smoothly. None of the red flags or warning signs for a poorly run project ever appeared. Dan and I were talking earlier today, you know, RFIs on this project, minimal. Change orders, minimal. Problems with plans and specs, minimal. Problems with the contractor, minimal. Nothing really occurred. It just ran very well. And I would say Dan would probably agree with me <laughs> as far as that's concerned that it didn't just run well, it ran exceptionally well. The project ran exceptionally well because of our construction team, our architect, our contractor, our owner's rep, and our school administration. The project ran exceptionally well because of the complete dedication and commitment of our building committee. At this point, I consider the work of the building committee to be done. We have completed our job, and it's time for us to move on. With this all being said, I recommend that the board dismiss us tonight and that, and that they give us thanks for all the job that we've done. Now, before I conclude, I want to give special thanks to a few folks here tonight that I didn't mention at the school's opening ceremony, uh, which I should have. First, I want to thank Kelly Murphy, I want to thank Christine Massengill, and I want to thank Jackie Perry, three members of the school board who have been great assets and leaders on this project. All three of these board members work continually on this project while simultaneously serving on the school board. Second, I want to thank Todd Jepson. Todd has been a great person to have on this project and has been a constant voice of reason and common sense. Third, I want to thank Bob Mitchell. Bob is the only person I could ever call at 5 o'clock in the morning <laughs> to talk about this project. <laughs> His counsel was always appreciated and frankly needed. And then fourth, this is a person I should have recognized at the opening ceremony and didn't. I want to thank Joanne Sizemore for her work on this project. Joanne has been one of the hardest workers on this project. Moreover, while leadership in the superintendent's office changed during the course of this project, Joanne has always provided the project with continuity and made sure this project stayed on course. So thank you to you all. You helped make this project a success. At this point, I have nothing further to say, and for the last time, I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions or comments from the board? I would just like to say it's a pleasure working with you. You did an outstanding job chairing the committee and um, couldn't thank you enough for everything. So. Thank you. Anyone else? I yeah. thought it was, uh, it's amazing uh, that the people who started off on the committee stayed on the committee. It, it, you know, I've served on other committees, and and people start to drop off and drop off and drop off. And a few people did when they thought, you know, they said, well, I did my part. I did this or I did that. or And even those folks showed up when we had the dedication and and the... The input, Rebecca's here, Rebecca Mitchell, who was a student at the time and was a student <laughs> rep. You always gave her two cents worth. Must be a chip off the old block, you know, but it. Uh, On the mother's side. Chris Brownsey. <laughs> <laughs> no, I saw Chris, Chris Brownsey last evening. Was, his children no longer are at Wentworth, but he was there to that special program last evening. He said, This is what we work for. This is what it's all about. 
And uh, that's how people are feeling. And it's, I thank you for your leadership, Paul. I truly, truly thank you for the leadership that you provided and the atmosphere you created to be inclusive and to recognize the strengths of everybody who was on the committee, but especially you provided that leadership. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Kelly? Um, it was incredible to be a part of the building committee from the start. And just the vision from the very first few meetings, because I really didn't know what I was doing at the time. I mean, I was just a concerned parent that wanted to see what I could offer to the school project and had an interest in tearing down the old school, mostly. <laughs> Um, but just from the start, the um, input from Harriman and the guidance we got from central office and just, it really just all came together incredibly. And then <clears throat> last night at the um, Marsh Stories project at Wentworth, it kind of was like, okay, now everything that we were hoping came true. There were 40 kids on a stage doing this physical theater project that was about Maine history and they had done all kinds of scientific research and they learned about theater and storytelling, but then they also painted a mural that's now a permanent installation in the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. So it was, just, it was just a fantastic capstone to the whole project. To finally see the stage in use and you know, just the space, it would not have been possible in the old school that entire learning that went on for, you know, since the start of school. They started that in September. They've been working on this project, and it could not have happened in the old building. So it was, it was fantastic. So thank you for all of your guidance and work. It was amazing. Anyone else? I was just going to talk about the Marsh stories last okay. night. I, Kelly and I commented after about that show was exactly what the building you guys had envisioned way back when. They, these groups came together in the learning commons and painted together in mm -hmm. that space and yeah. used the stage. It was just sitting there, you felt like this is what this building is for and it's it's great. So great job. Mm -hmm. Mrs. I'd just like to add that it's been an incredible journey because I still I'm trying to wipe out that first night at the old Wentworth <laughs> at 100 degrees sitting in the audience with all those, with over two, 300 people, I think it was that night, complaining about the school and what we were going to do. And then when we had 40 people wanting to be on a building committee, I was like, ooh, I wonder what's going to happen here. And we all said, well, let's have anyone who wants to be on the committee be on the committee to help out. And it was just incredible to see the number of people in this town who did not have children in our school system who came to volunteer and help out with their expertise. So I think um, it was, it's been an incredible project and uh, should be a role model for other towns and for our own town in, when you want to do a project like this. But Paul, mm -hmm. it's been a pleasure working with you and talking, not at 5 in the morning, but at 7 in the morning. <laughs> I don't have you in my phone because I know the number by <laughs> Well, 5 a.m. is my Bob Mitchell time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And And just before you think you might run out the door, I do want you to know we have a long-range planning facilities <laughs> information coming here, so <laughs> if you're going to stay in Scarborough, which I'm sure you will, <laughs> thank you. Okay, next I want to introduce uh, Mr. Dan Cecil. Dan is principal and architect for Harriman Associates, and he's also the project consultant for our Long Range Facilities Planning Project. The Scarborough Long Range Facilities Planning Team has been engaged in this project since the fall of 2012. Uh, the school board <coughs> contracted with Dan as the project consultant on November 21st of that same year, and he, Dan is here tonight to provide to the board the first public overview of the project. Uh, Dan and his team have created a very sophisticated model for capturing facilities' needs, current conditions, um, an equally sophisticated system for running any number of planning, facilities planning scenarios. Tonight we're going to be looking at the project 
Um, and I think this is important because you have a lot of material in front of you. This is going to be at the 3,000 foot level. Um, it's really an overview and sort of the focus on the focus is on the scope of the project and getting a sense about it. Um, there is, as I said, a volume of materials that you have here. Um, there's probably extras of that as well. Um, and uh, you can peruse all of that at a later date. I think what Dan is going to do is give you a little bit of a walkthrough of what you have in your hand. Um, and you can take a look at that later. We'll be sure to check in with the school board for guidance as to where you all would like to drill down a bit more because we know that you will want to do that and we actually do need to do that. And so we will schedule some more time accordingly either in a regularly scheduled workshop session or a, spe a specially <coughs> scheduled workshop time. Uh, the key uh, leadership uh, council representatives from across the schools and the districts are here tonight to hear Mr. Cozell's report. They came, and as well, they are here <laughs> to hear the um, presentation from Mr. Cecil in terms of the long-range facilities plan and the status of that project. Okay. Thank you, George. Uh, before I start, I just want to echo what everybody said, that uh, the, the leadership in Scarborough on this project and the community participation, I just, I just haven't seen in other projects. And I, I would say without qualification that, that uh, uh, you're the best uh, uh, committee leader and committee chair I've ever worked with, and, and I think that the primary success of all this project has really been Paul's leadership, and plus all the all the work that all of you have done. So it's been it's been fun, and I will say that Rebecca was great at putting her dad in his place, <laughs> <laughs> telling him to keep quiet, not not go over the top. So we loved having her around. Um, okay, you have. Two primary handouts that we're going to talk about tonight. One is the 84, 85 page, uh, 8 and a half by 11. And then there's an 11 by 17. Uh, we blew up some of the tables that are in this 8 and a half by 11 document because they're hard to read at 8 and a half by 11. When we do the final printing of the document, then we'll, uh, we'll include these tables as 11 by 17. So it, they're, they're there for your convenience, and I'm going to refer to them. Uh, in the agenda, the top part of the agenda is a list of goals uh, that have been discussed at the, at the committee level so far. But I want to say that everything in these documents is subject to your review and approval and editing. Uh, it's a draft. Uh, you'll see as you read through this, the, the document uh, line by line, there are notes to myself or notes to Jen Nitschman or notes to somebody uh, about questions that have come up that still need answering. So it is your document and, and basically it will be done when you decide that everything that you want to know about your facilities uh, is known. And, and primarily what, what we are asked to do is to look at how well your facilities are meeting your educational needs or not, uh, what the operations costs of the facilities are, how energy efficient they are. Uh, we looked at student population trends in the district, uh, and all of those get woven together into a, uh, a document that then has to link to your educational plans, all the works that, that you've done in the past few years uh, in, in terms of working on educational programs in the district. And when it's finally done, those two documents should be tightly interlinked, and you'll have uh, a series of recommendations. You'll also have uh, a capital improvement master plan, uh, which will uh, tell you, prioritize for you what you want to do in the next one, three, and five years. And you'll have pricing for some of the options that we're going to talk uh, about tonight. So starting with the, uh, the big thick eight and a half by 11, what I'm going to do tonight to stay at a 3,000 foot level is I'm going to really concentrate on, on tables, drawings, and the big picture, sort of the, the key concepts that have come up so far. And I look forward to uh, having you read all of this and, and talking about this in more detail in the future. So on the first page, and I'm going to be flipping through these pages, I've numbered them by hand on the lower right-hand corner so we can, we can flip through this uh, fairly efficiently. Uh, but as an overview, one of the, the most interesting things is that um, your population projections from planning decisions, which were done before the middle school, I mean before Westcott, uh, Wentworth was um, uh, beginning on, on the planning, and that, that the page, the reproduction of that planning decisions population projection is on the first page of your 11 by 17. What that shows is between now and 2020-21 and, uh, school year, you're projected to, to uh, decline in student population somewhere around 400 students, plus or minus. So that's, that's one thing to consider. The other thing to know as an overview is that 
you have capacity for students in your district right now that's about another 400 students or so uh, beyond that. So the 400 students of additional capacity, extra capacity that you have right now is a very reasonable number because most school districts I think want to be in the 15% or more range of extra capacity so that they can accommodate easily changes in, in population, changes in programs, influx of, of people and, and out migration. So uh, the amount of extra capacity that you have is, is good and healthy and normal. It gives you some flexibility. The, the population decline uh, is something that needs to be monitored because in theory, if it does decline that much, then, then you may be talking about the potential of having maybe two much physical space in your school district and whether or not you want to continue maintaining all, all of that or doing something differently. So again, those are, those are, that population projection is a, is, is a big thing to be thinking about. Um, what will be interesting to see is if you get a bump from, uh, from the Wentworth School uh, in the district in general because of, the, because of the building and whether or not that, that population projection actually goes down. Right now, the difference between what planning decision says you should have this year and what you actually have, is like, it, the difference is like seven-tenths of one percent. I mean, it's a bullseye in terms of <coughs> statistics. So I think as a, as a beginning thing, we can look at the planning decisions projections and feel pretty good that they're probably pretty reasonable, but again, anything can change. I mean, the town could do something like change their ordinance for development uh, of houses, and then uh, in a year you'd have, you know, you could have 10% more kids in your district just, just from something like that. So it's something that has to be monitored. If you turn to page three really quickly, that's, that's the uh, planning decisions. Uh, again, you, I, I printed it out at 11 by 17 for you. Uh, the next thing that we did is we, we looked at, um, if you turn to page five, looked at that table, we looked at, uh, we, we put together drawings for every building in the school district. Uh, it took a lot of effort to, to pull together drawings because some, some schools are documented well in your district and some are not. And then we measured every single room uh, uh, of every school in the district and then we did a, a capacity analysis. And there's a, there's a series of formulas that you use to determine what the uh, capacity of a, of a school is. And this is a chart that, that, that plots uh, building capacity versus your student population. And what it, what it essentially shows you in a nutshell is that the, the primary schools are pretty much at their capacity. In, in other words, there's not a lot of room in their current configuration for a whole lot of extra, uh, extra students. They also have issues with uh, core spaces, which we'll talk about in, in a moment. The one, the one sort of outlier in all of this is the middle school, where when you run the formulas, it, it says that you ought to be able to put somewhere over 900 students in that building. You're at about 790 or so right now, but the building is crowded now. And the reason that, that uh, there's that difference is because of the core spaces in the building, your circulation spaces, narrow hallways, pinch points, a whole bunch of other things that are in this document. So officially we're saying that, that the real capacity of the middle school is more like 800 or 775 uh, to have a capacity that is comfortable um, uh, for, for teaching and for the students. If you flip now to page seven, so once we looked at uh, the capacities that your district has in you, then we looked at uh, your financial, uh, uh, what we call a financial profile. And uh, thanks to, to lots of work from Kate Bolton, and from uh, Todd, uh, we, we have collected your actual expenditures for the past couple of years, and I just got before Christmas your projected expenditures for 2014 and 15, and I'll add a table to this uh, between now and the next round. And we looked, we broke it down uh, by school. You can see the row across the top. And then we looked at, at all the physical plant costs that you're spending to operate those schools, and then we looked at st staff salaries and benefits. And uh, what, what's interesting, the first statistic that's interesting is that 85.9% of the cost of running these schools is uh, personnel and benefits and things like that, which is what you would expect. That's pretty, pretty normal for every time that we've, that we've done this. And the actual cost of, of heating and repairing and electricity and water and this, that, and the other is about 14% in, in your district. But when you go down a little bit, go down to the, uh, the, the last row at the bottom that says all physical plant costs, operations and maintenance, et cetera, a dollar per square foot. 
what you see is a two dollar and square foot number for the high school a nice low number and you see the primary schools are up at you know between eleven and almost fourteen dollars now you would expect a difference there because the high school is a big building, 300,000 square feet, so you're uh, averaging the cost over a very large building, and so you start getting lower dollar per square foot numbers. But still, the, the primary schools show that, that, that there's probably work to be done to improve the efficiency, energy efficiency of those buildings and lowering the operating costs. So that was the first thing that came out of this. The, um, the middle school at 882 a, a square foot is due partly to the fact that it has air conditioning, and that's, that's a little more expensive than, than a building without air conditioning. And it has, although the technology that was, that was built in it at the time was, was state of the art, there are more energy efficient technologies these days for, for cooling a building. So that number is a little bit higher than it might be otherwise, but it's because it's air conditioned, you use it 12 months out of the year, and it's used by community services as well as the school department, and, and, and it's a very important thing. If you go to the next page, which is page eight, once again, uh, you, then we just looked at utilities at the top, and again, the, about a dollar four square foot for the high school, and between two dollars and two twenty-three, so, so about twice as much uh, cost for the uh, for the elementary school for the primary schools, and then if you look down in, in, in the notes, uh, all utilities only. Scarborough High School costs a little over six and a half times the cost of all utilities at either eight corners of Pleasant Hill, but the building is 14 times larger. So again, another metric which says clearly that there's, that there's work that can be done to make that more energy efficient. On the next page, uh, page nine, we looked at just specifically heating costs. And once again, uh, if uh, the high school is the, is the baseline in dollars per square foot, um, then Blue Point, Eight Corners, and Pleasant Hill back in 2012-13 are about you know five to six times that that amount. And again, I'll add one more table from the data that um, um, uh, Kate has given me uh, to, to see what last year's data is and what you're projecting. But again, there's work to be done uh, in that area that should help lower your operations <coughs> costs. On page 10, we looked at just electrical. Again, we've looked at overall all utilities, heating, and now just electrical. The funny thing here is that you see the three primary schools are a little bit under the 1.0 baseline number of the high school, and, and probably part of that is because they don't have a modern ventilation system, so there's not motors running and ventilating and, and the heating that's required to keep that air, uh, to, to take it from well, today minus 10 to something comfortable in the mid-60s. So that number is artificially low because you don't have, you don't have a, a, a mechanical system in those buildings that meets, uh, meets the code. I'm going to skip now. Uh, the, the next page is simply 2013-14 numbers. Um, I'm going to skip now and go to page 14. And I'll refer you now to the second page of your 11 by 17 handout. The next thing we did is um, we spent uh, a couple of days, two long days in the district with, uh, with Todd with us. And we went to uh, the schools and we poked ceiling tiles and I brought, uh, I had two architects a mechanical engineer and electrical engineer. We basically inventoried the condition of your systems of the buildings. And then I put together this chart which, which talks about the building envelope. You know, in the energy world, they say the three most important strategies are to have a good building envelope, a good building envelope, and a good building envelope. That that's the, the primary thing, that, that buttoning up the skin of the building is the first strategy, and then everything else, how efficient the energy, how efficient the heating system is, et cetera, are, are, are secondary. And what we discovered from that is that the original wings of the primary schools are basically brick exterior, block interior, mortared together, no insulation. So it's essentially a solid piece of masonry between uh, the students and the outside world. So instead of having an R value, which is a measure of your insulation of between 19 and 20, which is what you'd like, their, their R value in, in those early wings is three, or maybe three and a half. So that's part of the reason why you see that delta between the operations costs of a building like the high school uh, or even the middle school that have, you know, for the most part, very good modern uh, insulation. I won't go through the rest of this, but um, for, for, the, for the energy people in the, on the committee, I, I think it's, it makes interesting reading because it, it explains some of the things that are, that are uh, deficient. The other thing that we found at the, in the original wings of the, of the primary schools was that 
there's a gap of about a foot or a foot and a half around the top of the wall, uh, the perimeter of the building. When you pop a ceiling tile, you can look at the outside wall. And instead of having a wall that goes all the way up and seals to the deck, uh, the wall stops and there's loose fitting bat insulation, sometimes with a vapor barrier, sometimes not. And that's in all three schools, and that, that's a huge energy loss. If you were to take an infrared photograph from the outside of the building on a day like today, you'd see a nice red band at the top of the outside wall going around the roof. So again, those are easy things to fix. That's real good, uh, inexpensive, low-hanging fruit uh, that we'll work with Todd to, uh, to put on a, uh, uh, a capital improvements list for the, for the future. <coughs> Next, uh, I'll take you to page 17, <coughs> and I'll also ask you to turn your 11 by 17 one more page in to look at table 1.10. So again, we've looked at student population, we've looked at how you're spending your money on your schools, we've looked at energy use, and so the next thing to look at was how, how well or not the buildings were, were serving your educational needs. And uh, one way to do that is to, to, to compare things to, to the Department of Ed standards. And that, you know, the Department of Ed standards are pretty reasonable and they're pretty conservative. So if you're significantly below, say, the class, typical classroom size from what the Department of Education recommends, you probably have some overcrowding problems. So we, th this table now has a whole lot more information to put into it. Uh, but this is the uh, the one that we had presented back in, uh, in April to the committee. And again, real quickly, you know, it goes through regular classrooms, library size, cafeteria size, kitchen, gymnasium, art, music, all of that kind of stuff. And, and, and the first thing that you see is in the primary schools, uh, the Blue Point School has pretty good sized classrooms overall, and Eight Corners and Pleasant Hill are, are fairly uh, below the 800 square foot standards that the state would recommend for a new classroom. Uh, if you were building new, and, and um, Wentworth, of course, has all 800 square foot classrooms. The other thing about the primary schools is that they have a combined cafeteria and gymnasium, which in new buildings uh, you would you would separate for flexibility and to give you the ability to, to have more community use and and uh, more programming, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one of the things that stands out is there are a number of core spaces in the middle school, in particular the cafeteria, a little bit less so with the library, but the cafeteria in particular is about 63% of the size that it should be by the DOE standards, which again are, are not are, are conservative, they're not generous, to what it should be for your, your current student population, assuming that you're, you're, you're seating uh, three groups of kids in there. So later on, we're, we're going to show you some, some ideas that we worked with the committee on about expanding that cafeteria as, as work in the future. Um, again, I'll leave, I'll leave this table for everybody's uh, study uh, between now and the next meeting. But, but again, the purpose of this document is to try to uh, catalog where you're okay and where uh, spaces are on the small side or maybe not working all that well at all. We switch now to page 28. This begins chapter two. The first chapter we, we're calling the schools we have. So again, it's filled with data about what you have on the ground today. Uh, and again, if there are other things you want us to look at, we can do that. Chapter two looks at uh, potentials for uh, consolidating in pr it's, uh, primarily the primary schools. And again, this is, this is not, um, we're not picking on the primary schools, but you have a couple of things going on in the background again. You have high energy costs in those small schools, operations costs. You have potentially declining population. So one of the things a master plan would naturally do is say, well, what could you do to reduce your operations costs? And, and would you, do you have too much square footage uh, per student? And what, what might you do about it? So all we did here is with the committee, we, we cooked up seven options uh, that could potentially lead to consolidating uh, the primary schools. And they're not in any particular order. Um, they, they would require, we say over and over again in the document, that any option that was seriously considered would, next step would be uh, to meet with the administrators for the affected schools and to find out if some of these ideas for consolidating would actually work. For example, if you were to uh, close Pleasant Hill School or decommission it, 
those students would go somewhere. There are several options where they might go. When they go to the new school, we've counted regular classrooms and what would be required to accommodate them because the primary schools are, are, are essentially full now. But then there's the whole other uh, piece of programming that needs to be solved, say art and music. If you took 169, 170 kids from Pleasant Hill and put them at another school, would that school be able to handle the additional sections for teaching art and teaching music and special ed and all those kinds of things? Would you have enough administrative space where the library then becomes suddenly too small? All those, that, that, that second layer of programming is not addressed, it's identified as being need to be addressed in, in this document, but it would require uh, some, some pretty good time with the administrators just to see how that would work. We, we would essentially go down through each of the buildings room by room and say, okay, if the second grade moved from here to here, what then would also come with it? How many, how many programs would have to move? What would they need for space? All that kind of stuff. So there's, there's a lot of work for that uh, in order to, to, to finalize options that, that you may find really uh, attractive. So page 28 starts out with the same financial data before as a, as a background. And then on page 30, it goes directly to looking at the Pleasant Hill School. Pleasant Hill has nine regular classrooms, uh, kindergarten through first grade, kindergarten through second grade. So if you were to take those those kids, you'd have to replace at least nine classrooms in some other location in the district. Plus, as you see down uh, a couple lines down, uh, core spaces, special program spaces, uh, a a administration, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look at the next page. Um, the, the idea, there's, it's always a, uh, a complicated thing to think about decommissioning a school, uh, any school at any time, because one of the things you need to think about if you look halfway down page 31 is what potential future options are for, the, for that building. <coughs> Keeping it, uh, if, you, if you kept it and mothballed it, you're still going to spend probably somewhere between fifty to $75,000 a year just to keep it from deteriorating keeping the electricity on, the fire alarm system, keeping the building from freezing. It would be a lot cooler than it would be with kids in there. So there's, uh, taking a building and mothballing it is not a zero um, you know, cost afterwards. <laughs> Selling it would be a zero cost, but, but, but not mothballing it. So there's some options there that you would consider. The next page, page 32, uh, was, was really interesting, and I want to thank uh, Sarah Redmond in your transportation department for producing the maps on the next two pages. Uh, this first one, which is this board right here, shows uh, in, in orange the, uh, the area of all the eight corner students, in blue uh, the Pleasant Hill students, and in uh, red or pink uh, the Blue Point students. And the first thing that, that occurred to us when we saw it is that Route 1 is, is obviously the connector between this side of the town and this side of the town. But when you look at it, because of the Scarborough Marsh, it's about half the depth. It's like takes a bite out of the circulation system in the town. Um, it's about half the depth of, of, of the entire distance of the, of, of the town in, in that dimension. So what, what, that, what that started suggesting in, in discussions with the building committee was how much sense did it make to, to uh, if you were to, to uh, move the Pleasant Hill students somewhere else to send them to uh, Blue Point? Because the distance from the existing Pleasant Hill School to your campus uh, is about three miles, to eight corners is about five miles, but to, to send those same kids from Pleasant Hill uh, around to Blue Point is over seven, seven miles. So, so that, that was, became a, a, a very interesting geographical thing that informed or, or, and, and may eliminate some of, the, some of the options. The next page is a, is a fun little document in that it shows each of these Blue Points uh, again, all this came from Sarah Redmond, is the location of a bus stop. Now, that little, each little blue circle doesn't tell you if it's one kid or four kids that are being picked up, but it does show you uh, where the schools are and where the, the, the kids are being picked up and sort of the distribution of, of, of kids, which is always an interesting thing to know. Um, next page, 34, is we get to the first option, option one. And again, uh, there's, these are in no particular order, and they're just ideas that came out of several meetings with the building committee and doing brainstorming. And I'm going to ask you now to take your 11 by 17 again and go to uh, table 211, which, which the first page is the next to the last page of your, of your handout. 
Table 211 tries to give you the Cliff Notes version of what is, I don't know, 40 pages worth of analysis uh, in, the, in the report. So um, we'll look at the drawings here and in, and in your 8 and half by 11, but we'll sort of concentrate on this 11 by 17 because it gives you a good summary. So option one, close Pleasant Hill and add on to both Blue Point and eight, eight Corners. So it describes, you take those nine classrooms and you distribute them across two other schools um, and, and, and then you would, the assumption was that if you added on to one of the primary schools, one of the goals would be to eliminate the, the, the quote, um, semi-permanent or quasi-modular, however you want to look at classrooms that are in those buildings. Those classrooms, uh, <laughs> numerically, if you get the, the information from the producer of those modular classrooms, they say that it meets all the energy codes and everything, but every time we go into those spaces, they're cooler than the other classrooms. Todd, actually, in, in one of our tours at um, Eight Corners, looked up after removing a ceiling tile and saw blue sky through the roof because a ventilation a pipe, which seems to be in, in, basically in every, every one of those classrooms, either the damper was closed or, or, or permanently open or broken or was never there or whatever, but there's cold air coming in, you know, all the time, 24-7, 365, uh, plus the, the way that they're constructed just doesn't seem to be as energy efficient as new modern construction, no matter what the manufacturer says. So we thought, well, if you were going to add on to those schools to move kids around, it would make sense at the same time to take care of uh, removing and replacing those classrooms with permanent space as well as uh, catching up on all your CIP projects uh, for the foreseeable future, upgrading mechanical, upgrading electrical, fire code issues, all kinds of things like that. So that's, that's the assumption. So if you look at... If you look at page 36 of your handout, you see what this might look like at Blue Point. So Blue Point has a very constricted site. It has a lot of wetlands around it. It has steep slopes on the back side of the building. So the assumption was that the four existing modular classrooms that are there would be replaced, and then four of those nine classrooms from uh, uh, Pleasant Hill would be added on top. So you'd have a two-story addition in the back, all new modern construction, and that's how you take care of it. We're also proposing uh, to, uh, if you did that, it would be nice to be able to expand the cafeteria, expand administrative space and storage space. Again, take care of your energy issues in, the, in that building. And we added uh, nominally 30 cars along the, along the front uh, because you'd need additional parking and, and the school just needs additional parking. So that's what would happen at, uh, at Blue Point. On page 38, to show you an idea about what might happen in that option uh, for, with eight corners. So eight corners has six modular classrooms that would be replaced with permanent space, and you take the remaining six from uh, uh, Pleasant Hill that you need, Adam as a second floor, so you'd have a two-story addition with 12 classrooms total. Again, some additional parking, some expansion to the admin offices, which, which desperately need them, and an expansion to the uh, cafeteria, a gymnasium space, and taking care of all those, all those other issues. Option two, which starts on page 39, is to close Pleasant Hill and move all of those students to Wentworth. Now, Wentworth was, was built with some additional space to grow into. <coughs> um, and uh, we, we took a, a, a very first crack at how you might put another 170 students in the building. And again, this, this would require uh, hours of meetings with, with Kelly and John and, and, um, and other administrators to see whether this works or not. But what we thought of doing is taking the Pleasant Hill schools and having a K-1-2 wing over here and then taking the rest of the students and putting them on the other wing and the two wings on the top, because there, there are these four basic classroom wings. Now, we, we show them just as an all third grade and all fourth grade and all fifth gr uh, uh, second grade and third grade, but currently um, Wentworth has a multi-grade uh, model, and that could be done here as well. We just, we just did it that way because it was very fast to do. But, uh, so in theory, if you shuffled some things around, there may be enough space to accommodate these additional nine classrooms, 
but we have to make sure uh, that you still have enough space for all your, all your existing programs, and then you'd have to model what happened to demand for your art room and your music room and special ed and things like that, because it's not clear that that number of students could be handled. I think there's probably not enough sections in the week uh, to, to handle that many more kids without either uh, having another part-time staff person or two and um, you know, and using some of the spaces that are not used right now, like the upstairs STEM spaces. So all of that would have to be modeled to make sure that it could really function. But it looked like it might uh, it, it might work. But but that's might with a capital M, just so everybody knows. So we did the first and the second floor proposal, and then the next option, option three, starts on page 43. And in that one, we said, why don't we? Um, Look at closing Pleasant Hill, and then the Pleasant Hill students will be distributed to Eight Corners and Wentworth to try to lessen the impact at Wentworth. So of those nine classrooms where the kids, we said let's put let's put seven at Wentworth. There's nine being used here, so seven would certainly fit more comfortably and leave you some some more space for other things. And then let's take um, the other two classrooms that are needed, add them to Eight Corners and do it just as a one-story wing. So you have the six modulars plus the two from Pleasant Hill. You would build it as one story there, but you would build it to take a second floor in the future. So you could continue to grow in the future if you wanted to, and you would do the other things we talked about, expanding here and there and, and adding, uh, adding classrooms. So there's, a, there's a, an option that's a little less impactful for eight corners and a little less impactful for, for, for Wentworth. Option four, again, there, there is Lots of discussion about uh, the cost of renovations and additions and how that might work. So option four said, well, let's just keep all the primary schools uh, in place, uh, using them the way that you are, but let's make investments in the energy systems at the primary schools to help lower your operations costs. So there's no specific drawing for that, but that's the strategy there. On the next page of your 11 by 17, Option five is that you would also keep all your primary schools in place and using them, but you would move the second grade uh, to Wentworth. And again, uh, that, that would require, you've got um, 11 classrooms at the second grade now, um, but if you did 20, 20 students per classroom on average, you could, you could uh, put those kids in 10 classrooms and put those in Wentworth, and, and, and that would fit pretty, uh, pretty well, pretty easily overall. Um, that one um, is, is interesting because it keeps the primary schools, and I think one of the, what the text says in here is that in considering uh, closing a school, one of the things you have to think about is what are you going to do with that, that, uh, that real estate? And in your case, uh, one of the things to think about is that you'd be uh, releasing from your ownership something that's essentially irrepre irreplaceable. I mean, it's hard to imagine where you'd get pieces of property, you know, more or less uh, towards the inner part of the, of, of the town in the future. Uh, it, property just isn't available and it's difficult to find and it's expensive. So uh, the, the losing that option of using those buildings for other things in the future would be negated if you sold any or all of those buildings. So again, another one, a big variable to think about. Um, Option six is uh, convert Pleasant Hill to a district-wide pre-K program. There's also some discussion at the last meeting. You, you have, there are regional educational programs that Scarborough participates in, and if you had extra space at one of your schools, you might be able to host some of those programs, and some of those programs actually generate revenue uh, for, for hosting them. So that would be something to, to think about. Uh, and in that option, uh, you would keep Pleasant Hill, convert its use to something else, but move all the second grades to Wentworth, uh, just like in, in, in earlier options. Option seven is one where the question was, well, what, what would, would it mean to build an all-new elementary school and to put all your primary school students in it? So in that, in that option, you would decommission all three schools or do something with them, and you'd build an all-new school. So. You could do one of two things. You could either look for land somewhere in the, um, uh, in the town to, to site a school like that, which um, both in the case of when we did the high school and at Wentworth is, is, a, is a very difficult, time-consuming, and tricky business, 
or you could look at the possibility of, <clears throat> of citing one more building on your on your campus here. So on page really ahead of myself here. On page 52 and 53, we start to show you some options. 52 shows you, I don't know how many of you know this or not, but you actually have an outlet at the back side of the, of the site that the middle school is on out to Sawyer Road. There's a, there's a lot that, that goes right, and I, and I verified this with Dan Bacon, the town planner. So there's been talk in the past, uh, even working on Wentworth, about the cost and potential of, of uh, linking back out to Sawyer so you'd have yet another way to get in and out of the campus uh, so you're not bottlenecking any, anywhere. So in this option, all we did is we said, well, based on the contour drawings that, we, that you have already and on the wetlands <laughs> mapping that you have already, there might be two areas, these two gray areas, that might be able to be level enough and dry enough uh, to accommodate a building in the future. And in order to access them, uh, although you could make a spur off of the, the middle school uh, driveway and just go to the elementary school and back, but you might want to think about going all the way out to Sawyer Road so that, again, you could take some relief from the, the cars that are jamming up at the middle school as well as providing access to this, uh, to this primary school. So what we did is we, we, we just uh, bid a school in Corinth, that's a brand new uh, elementary school that's 581 students. Um, we, we set the, the size of this new school at 650 students, so give you some room for growth. You're at you know, 615 or something like that at the, at the moment. And then we used the uh, bid prices for the Corinth School on page 55, we came up with a, just a very preliminary uh, total project budget for a, a building like that. And obviously, that's a lot of money, uh, and it's and it's just a again, it's a very short exercise. It could it could indeed be less than that. It'd be a lot less. It'd be four hundred thousand dollars or so less if you didn't uh, build a connector road out to Sawyer. But it's it, the other thing that it can show you is that at some point in the future, even if it's 20 years from now. It might be a place where a building might end up, depending on what, what happens between now and then. What would have to happen in order to test that is you'd have to resurvey the wetlands and you'd have to survey the vernal pool. You'd have to do some environmental uh, research because uh, all your documents uh, are for that are over five years old and the DEP wouldn't accept them. And the, the laws, in particular for things like vernal pools, change uh, periodically. So we'd want to know of, of if these wetlands are still where they're, they're showing, if they've grown or gotten smaller, and then where exactly uh, the, the vernal pools are and then what the setbacks are at that time from the vernal pool. So there would be a lot of research to be done to, to verify that that's a viable site, but that's the fun of a master plan is you can just look at a lot of, a lot of different things. Um, if you turn now to page 64, now we're in chapter three, and we're looking at the middle school. So I won't, I won't go over in any detail the, the list of the, of the issues that the middle school has in terms of overcrowding and undersized core spaces, and you know all those kinds of things. That's all documented in great detail in, in this in this document. But the question is. Um, what could you do to alleviate some of those problems, and uh, where could you expand the building if you if you wanted to do that? So this this first uh, drawing on on page 64 shows uh, expansion of the cafeteria, expansion of the admin offices here by basically just moving a wall out to where that curve is, expanding the kitchen and then expanding uh, a wing of the building. If you go to the next page, page 65, you'll see a potential summary about how all that might happen. So on the lower left-hand side of your drawing, it shows the expansion of the cafeteria and kitchen. Uh, you've got an art room here, that's the, the second art room that's very, very undersized, so that would be enlarged. You would expand the admin area. You would also expand this little gap here in the back. You would fill in to expand guidance, which really needs space. 
And what that does upstairs is then it gives you some extra space in the library, which also needs expansion. So a nice little addition there would, do, would take care of two things. And then you could put a, a new wing going off the right side of the building with essentially the same plan uh, that you have of the existing classroom wings. And uh, you could do that to replace the Passamaquoddy uh, modulars. So basically, there are 12 classrooms in those modulars. And that's a, that's a two-story, 12-classroom addition. And it works pretty well in, in the site plan and in the floor plan. Uh, it would basically hook in to the end of that hallway that runs along the locker rooms at the gym. And you'd be uh, adding some parking and be taking care of some of the uh, uh, of the uh, traffic circulation issues on the on the existing site, and that the, the drawing, <clears throat> the site drawing in the page before, uh, shows that road going out to Sawyer as a part of this. In fact, I'll, what it does is um, <coughs> it allows you another way to get to parking here without having everybody having to go around that loop in the front of the the middle school, which is a real uh, difficult place. Not only because it's curved, uh, it, it's because this, the center island is raised, so you have very bad sight lines, and you've got cars backing up directly into that uh, curve on, a, on, a, on an edge with no way to see cars that are coming around the corner. <clears throat> so from a traffic standpoint, everything about it is pretty much, uh, you know, not best practices. That's, that's the way I'll put it. On the second floor of this option one for the middle school, Again, you can see the gray area is the upper part of the, uh, of the new classroom wing and a new expansion area for the, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, library. Next page, if you go to page 67, this is another option that came out of, again, discussions with the committee. Whoops. Looking at the site plan, we're trying to figure out a way uh, if, if Connecting out to Sawyer Road was just too expensive, either now or in the future. What could be done to improve the traffic circulation uh, around the front of the building? So what we proposed to do was to expand parking in this area to the side of the building. And this first part of the loop would, be, would become, instead of one way, it would become two way. So you could get into the parking by short circuiting that loop right there or you could come in and be able to go that direction to, to, to access it. And then when you leave, you could do the same thing. You could either drive out here and access the circulation in this point, or you could drive out here and turn left instead of having to go around the loop. So you reduce the amount of traffic that's, that you're, you're forcing into the, that, that loop before. You would also change the, all the parking for visitors to be parallel parking rather than 90 degree parking. So people are pulling in and it's much, much safer and easier for them to see cars coming around that curve rather than backing right out uh, into it, uh, which, which would be a, a terrific in improvement in, in safety. So a little bit of site work would produce some, some significant gains. The, the, other, the other thing about it is this is about 80, 84 spaces that are basically underneath Passamaquoddy. So some of the parking problems that you have at the middle school would, would be uh, certainly uh, relieved, if not solved completely, just by uh, removing those modulars. And they're in the, you know, exactly where you want them, right there next to the, next to the building. So what we did on this plan, uh, same <coughs> other additions, renovations uh, to the building, but what we did is we took that, that wing and we, we pulled it out about another 15 feet so that in the future you could have a corridor to another wing. So you could actually have a two-story wing here and a future two-story wing there so that the middle school could continue in theory to keep growing if you, if you made the first addition uh, in a way that would allow it to be connected in the future. And again, so the, obviously what that does is it means that all the students are in the building. They're not having to leave the building, cross a major uh, driveway, and then go into Passamaquoddy with all the security issues that that involves. So this one, this one we liked be just because it gave you an idea for even more growth in the future going out. So again, second floor, oops, second floor, same scheme. So the last option for the middle school, and basically the end of, end of this presentation, um, originally we had said uh, moving the sixth grade of the middle school to Wentworth seemed like 
too many students, not enough room at Wentworth. We just, it, did, it didn't, for a number of reasons, it didn't seem like a great idea. We didn't study it. And in one of the recent meetings, uh, I think it was Jane said, well, you know, I think we ought to study it because we should just look at it. So the, the, what we're calling option three attempts to relieve all the overcrowding at the middle school by taking one whole grade out of it and putting it at Wentworth. And the way that we proposed uh, to do that, again, was to put them, we, we need about 12 classrooms to do that. And what we said is, that, well, maybe you could, you could get 12 classrooms on the second floor of this south-facing wing by uh, using the STEM lab and by using the team gathering space as a, as a classroom. You could even put up a temporary wall to, to screen it out from noise from the hallway. But you could get 12 classrooms up there, again, pending a review by the administrators that everything else would work as well. Uh, what that does is it makes the, the population of, of uh, Wentworth go up to 965 kids, but the middle school population goes down to 545. Now, a couple of things. The, the Wentworth was designed for 800 students using the Scarborough School Department standards, which is about 20 students per regular classroom. But for those full-size classrooms, the Department of Ed would say, well, you can put, actually put 1,000 students in there. I mean, you may not want to, but, but there, is, there is that difference. So even if you're in the 900 student range, <clears throat> you, you could still, the core spaces, I think, would, would still work there. The question is whether special ed and art and all those others would, would have enough capacity to take care of it. The other thing to remember in, in all of these options is that your population projections are, are, are assumed to go down. So that by the time 2021 rolls around, this configuration uh, at Wentworth, instead of being at, at 965 students, you're at 773. You know, you're, you're sort of right at the number that you'd like to keep at using the, uh, uh, the DOE, uh, using the Scarborough uh, School Department standards. So you've got this factor of time and this declining population to think about with every option that you're looking at because as things go ahead and if those projections are right, uh, any, any original sense of crowding will continue to diminish and diminish and diminish. And so if you look at that first page again of the 11 by 17, you'll see how they're saying that it would diminish. Now, again, it could be all wrong. It could be in two, three years you find that you've got a lot of growth uh, because you have great schools and you have new buildings and, and where you're located. So it would make sense to monitor all of all these populations uh, every year really, really closely, in particular to see what happens with, to, to Wentworth. I don't know if you, did you have a boost this year of, of students at Wentworth that you weren't expecting already? Yeah, okay, okay. So anyway, so um, there's, there's a lot of additional data in here of an educational program and technical nature that, that greatly influences the validity of any uh, of these options. And, and so we're, we're not going to talk about that tonight because it's just too much uh, material. But that's, that's essentially my, my overview. And again, th th I guess the one last thing I want to say about Passamaquoddy is that if you took the sixth grade out of the middle school, but you kept Passamaquoddy, then you would definitely have uh, much more free space than you have now for all kinds of things. What, what, when we interviewed uh, Barbara and David uh, well, six or eight months ago now, um, they said that they were projected to have five floating teachers this year. I don't know if that's still the same, uh, if that's actually happened or not. But So there's, there's considerations like that. If you were to eliminate Passamaquoddy, uh, it would be interesting to see if, if you, you simply remove a building that, that's uh, not a great building, but you retain your overcrowding problems uh, at that school because you lose that extra space that would be available there. So th again, there's a lot of variables to consider, but I think that they're all at least identified in the report so far, and we look forward to your review and any more input. Thank you, Dan. Uh, any Comments or questions from the board? So I just had one. Yeah. Why, why would we, at the middle school, uh, be considering <coughs> if we added on to the middle school, <coughs> excuse me, please, <coughs> expanding the cafeteria and not the gymnasium as well? 
Well, you could. Uh, the, the, the thing about the gymnasium, if you, look, if you just look at the square footage, you think, oh, that's a pretty nice size gym. But you, you have the track up above, which is a great resource, the study says, but what it does is it, is it uh, hangs over the, uh, the boundary lines of the court and makes it impossible to, to shoot from various places inside. So its effective use is diminished uh, because of the layout of the, of the building. But that is something that you could look at because there is room um, uh, around it uh, to do that. It's, it's, uh, I don't know which way the framing goes right now. It probably goes in that direction. So expanding it in that direction wouldn't necessarily be a, a terribly difficult thing to do, but something that you could consider. We can draw anything, again, and that's the fun of a master plan. Chris? Uh, I, I just wanted to highlight, and Dan, maybe you can address this as well, that there were a couple of, of functions behind this study as well. It wasn't just looking at, at future potential expansion and changes. I, and Todd, I think, can speak to this as well. We did a, that evaluation of our existing infrastructure was probably worth the return on investment alone, not just from a <coughs> forward-looking perspective, but it really put things into, into um, real hard data that we can look at on doing ROIs for short and long-term facilities planning. So even if we don't use any of the study to, to adjust footprints or make changes, which right. it's good for that, for right. sure. Um, it's still a useful tool for Todd, I think, in doing facilities maintenance, and it does help us in our regular operation as well to look at doing some investments, let's say, in, in energy efficiency or something, utilizing our existing budget numbers, where to best put them for the for best return on investment. Right. So I just wanted to highlight that to you. Yes, it absolutely, just Chris. A study to, to look at you know, shutting down or, or potential expansions or, or moving things around. There's right. a lot of extra value added, I think, to this study that, that um, really needs to be mentioned as well. Right. As well. Anyone else? No? Well, thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate, you. Like to Appreciate it. Take a look at thank It's been you. a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of work. Yeah. I think it's amazing, Dan, that you got to cover that whole realm of all of those options in a way that I think pretty much all of us were following. I hope so. Uh, and uh, <laughs> not, I didn't see many heads spinning, yeah. uh, but it is, it is head spinning material, really. Yes. And you did a great job with that. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> 6.0 is the chairs report. I just have two brief things for you. Um, you might have seen in your email the Southern Maine Partnership meeting on January 21st. Did you get that? Or did that just come to me? I didn't hear all of that. Southern see. Maine Partnership meeting on the 21st. Did any of you see that? Yeah. No, and we do belong to Southern Maine Partnership, I would imagine. So um, it's going to have their dine and discuss meeting on January 21st from 4 to 6.30. It's at South Portland High School. And the reason it's so interesting is because the topic is proficiency-based diplomas. So there might be some good information there for us to just hear what, what other towns around us are, are thinking and what, what educators have in mind for what's going to have to happen in order to meet the state law. So I'm sorry, can you forward that to us? I'm, I didn't sure. receive it, so just... Yep, yeah. I'll do that tomorrow. And I've already signed up myself, so if anyone else decides to join me, um, you'll see right on the email that you can just click on and sign up, sign up for yourself, so... Okay. And then another is that um, I did have a phone call from Councilor Babine, and he is asking to... Um, tentatively schedule meeting with us uh, uh, here at, at our next workshop meeting, um, January 22nd. And he wants to just bring a review, but he also uh, is asking that if you have any, any questions or any comments you'd like to make, that um, if you just feed those to me, I'll be speaking with him next week. Uh, 7.0 committee reports. Do you want to start, Mr. Chiasso? Sure. Um, finance met this, uh, this evening before this meeting. We um, consolidated our goals, worked on our, our, our goals for the year. Um, Kate's going to polish those up, and we'll have those to present for the whole board and for everybody else. 
Um, they uh, align fairly well, I think, with the overall goals of the board. Um, the, um, certainly some areas I think will, they won't be too many surprises, I don't think, but um, one of the focuses is improved communication, of course, we'll be working on those things, but they'll be clear when they come out. Uh, we were supposed to also do an update for the joint town and school board finance committee meetings. Unfortunately, um, uh, Tom Hall, I think, was sick this week, so we weren't able to hold that meeting, and we're going to try and reschedule um, hopefully within the next couple of weeks, but we've got some, some travel issues to work out. So it's not a, a question of, of not wanting to keep it going. There's been some, some illness and some scheduling conflicts, so we're still working on that. Um, the Scarborough Business Liaison Group met this morning, um, very early morning meeting, which um, is is uh, it was good. Everybody was was uh, <laughs> uh, certainly had a lot of coffee, and it was nice and and uh, and, and comfortable. We met at the uh, Maine Medical Center Research Facility over across uh, across Route One. Fantastic, amazing facility, and uh, um, I don't know if they do tours for the public, but we got one, and it was uh, it's really amazing with some of the things that we're doing there. But we're we're trying to work with the business community on a, a, a few initiatives. One of which is some some. Um, career counseling and some career um, opportunity development that Mr. Creech is leading for the high school, um, specifically around the uh, April 15th, April 16th, I believe, 15th, um, when the juniors are doing their SAT testing. So um, hopefully we've got some, some good frameworks in place. Now the, the, the work begins and we have to start lining up some, some participants and some uh, some activities, but um, if the framework that's been in place so far is really exciting, and, and I'm sure when things are finalized, Mr. Creech will come up or Dr. Ensis will give us an update, and um, really exciting, looking forward to doing things that we've been talking about for a while in terms of career development for our students, and uh, the business community support has been absolutely phenomenal so far, not just business, but with the local universities as well, so um, I'm looking forward to that positive outcome. Very good. Thank you, Mrs. Gray. <coughs> Communications committee met yesterday morning and we sort of had a brainstorming session on how to connect more with the community and a few of us attended the event and it's been brought up a couple times tonight um, at Wentworth last night and we would love for somehow to take performances like that and either take them on the road and go to Piper Shores or go to Scarborough Terrace or the Veterans Home and engage the community that way or Maybe there's a way to bring the WOW members to the school. Something where there's a connection to the school and they can see, you know, what's happening, not just read about it in the leader, um, but really see and feel sort of what's going on. The other thing we talked about was distributing this schoolhouse news um, in more public places, maybe at Scarborough Grounds or banks. Um, we talked about Max Daly, just businesses around town, um, getting them more involved, and it might make sense for you and I to talk. Um, and maybe programs that students do, if there's an art project or something that's going on, can we get a table at a bank and display it? Just to get the word out more on what kids are doing, what the schools are up to, and, and engaging the community. Thank you. Policy? Policy met yesterday as well. We um, reviewed Few, a lot of policies, actually, that I, I think will be coming before the board at our next business meeting, if not the workshop. Um, when the new website was launched, there were so many connections to old, well, to the, where things used to be. So you could access policies on several different websites before. And so now it's a matter of making sure those all go away and that the correct ones in the updated, revised versions are the only thing that you can find in are on the school website. So we ran into a couple of those. It looked like we hadn't reviewed them since 2002. And I'm like, I really feel like we already did this one, but okay, let's do it again. And then we realized it had just not pushed through to the new um, to the new. <coughs> site. So we have a whole bunch that we've reviewed, even though we had revised them earlier, and um, some that we worked on, like the transportation policy, for instance, and um, information for community groups and how going forward how we will disseminate that information won't be on paper. Little little tease for you there. It won't be on paper. Um and um 
So th those will come up at the next meeting. You'll have a bunch to review. Thank you. Ms. Perry? Yes, the negotiations uh, committee continues to meet. We are, we are negotiating a contract with the administrators group, and we are negotiating a contract at the present time with custodians and cafeteria workers. Also, I will be attending a Maine School Boards Association meeting on Saturday. And on Tuesday evening, I attended the uh, steering committee for Operation Cupid. That will take place uh, on the 10th of February at 6 o'clock in the cafeteria at the middle school. And just an alert to, to parents that the children will be talking about making the Valentines for the veterans. And uh, the committee has decided to add uh, first responders this year. In other words, uh, both active and retired police fire rescue from the town of Scarborough. So they will be getting the Valentine thank you for your service uh, as we have done with the veterans. There are no deployed troops from Maine, which was the original Operation Cupid. And thanks to the middle school, Tom Griffin and, and the uh, Builders Club, uh, I think this is either the sixth or seventh year. And if you want to have a good time that evening, show up at the middle school and make valentines and decorate baskets and uh, bags and all of that good stuff. So. That's starting off again. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Massengill? All set. And a student report. Kristen. So first of all, apologies on behalf of Emma. She said she was swamped in homework last uh, tonight. Um, so all the students recently returned from their winter break, and high school students are preparing for the midterm exams, which are currently scheduled to start on January 16th. Uh, the chorus held a concert, a holiday concert for senior citizens uh, right before the winter break and then proceeded to uh, carol around the hallways during last period, which was uh, wonderful. Um, the Wentworth School held a Stuff the, Stuff the Bus food drive in November, and as a follow-up, they calculated uh, 101,000 pounds of food was collected during that drive. Fourth grade students in Ms. Trombley's class raised money for UNICEF after they researched Ebola, and they shared uh, everything that they learned with other classes. And the Blue Learning Community, along with the rest of the school, raised uh, a ton of money. Uh, it was $1,915 for UNICEF through Trick or Treat for UNICEF. And then Ms. Trombley's class continued to write letters to Ms. Crosby uh, in order to get approval to hold a craft fair and bake sale to raise even more money for the cause. <laughs> and then first and second graders uh, at the primary schools were visited by a pilgrim and a Wampanoag from the Plymouth Plantation, and the students absolutely loved getting to meet them and the hands-on experience. And the K-2 students has also been participating in code and programmed Bebot, who is a robot, uh, and several parents with IT-related jobs volunteered to speak, so we'd like to uh, extend our thank yous to all of those volunteers. Thank you. I do have one thing. Um, Sebago Education Alliance meeting was canceled for December. I mentioned that in December, but um, the next meeting is this coming Monday. So I'll have an update on the next one. And where this coming Monday will that be? Uh, Sebago know? Education's meeting at Husson University in Westbrook. Right. Okay. Okay. 9.0, we have a recognition. Um, I have a couple of recognition items. This is first at the middle school. Um, with um, Principal Barbara Hathorne saying that she's very proud to report that the middle school's very own Doug Bennett won the Leaders Great Person of the Year Award. And she says that Doug is a role model for our students, which we all know, and by being an active, um, he's a very active and involved citizen in our community. Uh, he was uh, nominated um, and the Nominator said Doug has gone above and beyond his role as a teacher and coach to positively influence Scarborough community. He's organized the Scarborough <coughs> Strikes Out Cancer Group at the Scarborough Middle School, galvanizing dozens of students to fundraise thousands of dollars and engage in the fight against cancer. 
Uh, he was the pivotal force in communicating and, um, and getting parents um, out to support the school budget and vote. His efforts changed the direction of the school budget outcome, raised engagement to a new level. Uh, Doug, as many people know, grew up in Scarborough, currently resides here with his wife and his two kids. He's a great family man, teacher, coach, leader, and is a terrific choice for Scarborough's 2014 Great Person Award. So we congratulate and recognize Doug. Um, and the second is uh, the Empty Bowl Project, uh, which I don't know if people know. This is at the high school. It's an international grassroots effort to raise awareness of and to raise funds to fight hunger. Uh, as part of the project, our alternative education students have volunteered at Preble Street uh, Soup Kitchen uh, four times in the past uh, few years. Um, and for a December 19th, 2014 fundraiser, 16 students in our um, alternative ed program made over 150 bowls and mugs to sell. Uh, soups were made and donated by 11 staff members and in, in addition to making the ceramic pieces, uh, students were responsible for advertising, serving, and cleaning um, at the event. They raised $1,046 from selling the bowls and the soup and there was a generous matching donation from an anonymous member of the community. Um, and so altogether, our alternative ed students will be giving Preble Street Resource Center a check for over $2,000. So we congratulate them on their, their very innovative uh, work, um, service learning uh, at its best. It's awesome. Excellent. Two wonderful recognitions. 10.0, new business. 10.1, the minutes of December 18th. Do I have a motion here? Move approval is printed. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? I'm going to abstain. Gonna abstain. I wasn't present. You were present. Oh, okay. All in favor? Five plus one. 10.2, the minutes of December 29th. Do I have a motion? Move approval is printed. Second. Discussion? I have one. Um, in 5.0, when we decided to motion to go into executive session, I believe that I had made the motion to go into executive session. And I don't recall who seconded that. Anyone recall seconding? I thought it was you, Jackie. I think it was Jackie. Yeah, yeah. So, could yeah, be. I thought that yeah. you had seconded that, but you got that, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? As amended. As amended. Yes. <laughs> Six plus one. Okay, and now we have um, a motion. We are going to need a motion to go into executive session. We will not be returning to public session. Do I have a motion? Move. Move. Uh, I, I uh, cited it before, go into executive session for, uh, pursuant to 1 MRSA subsection 405 6A um, for the purpose of discussing a personnel matter not to return to public session. So move. Second. All in favor? Six plus one. We are adjourned. <laughs>